Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's third week of Deeper Dive with Buffalo Bayou Partnership. This week, we are discussing public art along Buffalo Bayou. Um, the last two weeks, we overviewed Buffalo Bayou Partnership, um, past plans and projects along Houston's historic waterway that have been managed and operated by our nonprofits. Um, the next week we talked about the Buffalo Bayou East Master Plan that was recently launched last October. And so this week we're taking a closer look at all of the immersive, interesting and captivating public art along Buffalo Bayou. Hosted by um, Karen Farber, who is our VP of External Affairs, as well as Judy Nyquist, who is a Buffalo Bayou Partnership Board member and co-chair of the Public Art and Programming Committee. So um, please enjoy and ask any questions you have in the chat box and we will answer as many as we can after the conclusion of the presentation. So I'll hand it over to Karen and Judy. Hi, thank you so much, Jessica. Here comes Judy. I'm Karen Farber and I'm gonna share my screen right now. Just a minute. Okay. So welcome to Buffalo Bayou Partnership Public Art presentation. Um, again, I'm Karen. I uh, should just start out by saying I am brand new on the BBP staff, having just joined in May, but the organization is not new to me at all. I've been involved with BBP for a long time, um, both through my previous role as director of the University of Houston's Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the Arts, where we collaborated a whole lot on projects that you'll see today, um, and also as a member of the Public Art and Programming Committee that Judy here chairs. Um, so just briefly to introduce Judy Nyquist, for those of you who don't know Judy, she is an extraordinary volunteer, board member of ours, um, real leader in public art, both uh, for Buffalo Bayou Partnership and for many, many organizations in town. Judy has really shaped not some, but most of the public art programs that we see in Houston that really have transformed our city from Herman Park to Discovery Greens programming to the University of Houston Public Art Collection and many, many more. So we are so grateful to have you with us, Judy. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction, Karen. Um, yes, I am not new to this organization. <laughs> I've been around for quite a while. Um, it's always a privilege to um, be involved in public art anywhere in town. You all know that's my passion, the people who know me. Um, and it's such a delight to be the co-chair of the Public Art and Programming Committee with Buffalo Bayou. Um, but as you know, um, most of you, uh, public art is not an individual or endeavor. Um, this takes a village. And as you'll see from the ambitious projects that we um, have to show you from the past and also what we have coming forward. Um, it's a collaboration of many people that bring these projects to fruition and I'm just a small um, part of um, this development. Yes, I agree. So we're going to start with a quick who, what, when, where, why, how, not quite in that order um, with Buffalo Bayou Partnership itself. Um, as many of you know, and especially if you saw these past two deeper dive presentations, this organization has been around for quite some time. Our mission is to revitalize and transform Buffalo Bayou. Uh, we oversee a 10 mile stretch all the way from Shepherd to the Port of Houston Turning Basin. Um, our board members represent civic, environmental, and governmental interests, a really diverse and interesting board from all these sectors and more. Um, and we have been supported by foundations, corporations, individuals, government agencies, really enabling us to leverage more than $200 million for the redevelopment of the waterfront so far and lots more to come. So in terms of public art, there are three categories of public art in our program. There are permanent works that I think it's important to emphasize are not so much a collection as permanent works that have become really iconic along the bayou, along the waterfront that we've come to be associated with. And um, many of these we spearheaded ourselves, but they were all joint efforts with other organizations. We'll talk about that a little bit more. As we pursue additional permanent works, 
um, they will often be integrated with the construction projects from the beginning. So I really firmly believe in having artists as part of the conversation as these construction projects are pursued um, and engaging artists in those conversations. But in terms of temporary works, this is always the case. Um, they activate unique spaces and we'll have more and more of those as we head east. And we also take advantage of special opportunities that come our way in terms of partnerships with other organizations that bring us ideas and our doors are always open to those ideas. Programming is a little bit different from temporary works in that we think about programming as performances, activations, events, one-time things that really gather people, convene people around something, whether virtually like now or, um, or in person on the waterfront. And um, I just wanna reemphasize um, our great desire to collaborate with um, institutions and individuals. Um, you know, we really need uh, the creativity of everyone in our purview and we welcome it. Yes, so in terms of the role of public art and how we think about it, you don't see art explicitly in our mission, but art is at the heart of so much of what we do because it really helps to animate, engage, reveal, connect these spaces. When we say connect, it's particularly important because this is about connecting people with the bayou and our sites and also connecting people with each other and communities with each other. Um, artists are drawn to the bayou for its unique characteristics and history. I have seen so many over the years artists come to town and come to the Buffalo Bayou and be inspired by the sites on the bayou more than any other sites, particularly as we head into the east sector. This is the case because of the industrial character and interesting um, history of those sites. And I'll add again, um, regarding artists, um, we um, like to invite whoever is coming to town, we welcome them. And as Karen says, there is not one artist that we've ever encountered that hasn't been just hugely inspired by what they've seen. So three tech, t uh, sectors, 10 square miles. Uh, the west sector is where Buffalo Bayou Park is, that so many of you know. Uh, downtown sector, sector, where our offices are, where I'm sitting right now, um, is the second sector, and then the east sector, which many of you heard about last week in our deeper dive. And for those of you who are uh, sort of geographically challenged, like myself, just to know, um, the West Sector that we are speaking so much about is that stretch of Buffalo Bayou between Sabine and Bagby, uh, Sabine and Bagby, uh, I'm sorry, Shepherd and Sabine, excuse me, Shepherd and Sabine, and um, is also uh, where we find Blue Dunlavy and the Waterworks Building and the very um, extensive trails. So you're gonna see lots and lots of public artworks that are in that West Sector now. I thought we would start from the beginning, the beginning of Houston's story at the what's known as the birthplace of Houston here at Allen's Landing, where in 1998, the design and art firm Tweak was asked to create a public artwork on the wharf uh, that references the history of this site. So Tweak etched into the wharf uh, the, the goods that were traded through Allen's Landing, which was really the original port. So as the Allen brothers came into the bayou, they stopped at Allen's Landing being the last place they could turn around and go back out. And they established the port right here at Allen's Landing and then later on moved it to where the port is now. Um, and so you can see some of those goods here. And just to remind you, Tweak is the, um, the design firm who very famously um, uh, launched the campaign, Houston, It's Worth It. Yes, and this project was done before that campaign started. That's right. So following this theme of, of words and language, um, but much later in 2015, Monumental Moments was commissioned for Buffalo Bayou Park. This is comprised of six words that are located at different places in the park that are about four feet tall each. And I can, the words are explore, pause, reflect, listen, emerge and observe. These words were selected obviously for their sort of contemplative nature. Um, all of these uh, are um, sculptures that um, is a little bit of a discovery and once you happen upon them then you can think think about and um, ab ab about the, what these words reference. I have a small model of one here. Ah. See what it looks like. And of course they're 
very present on social media as well. This yeah. is my favorite one, Reflect. The Henry Moore sculpture, of course, many of you know, is in the Fondren Meadow along Buffalo Bayou Park. And Judy, do you want to talk about this? Just that um, this is part of the city's collection, an iconic piece of sculpture, an iconic artist, obviously, um, really commands the space there in this beautiful meadow that, um, as you see in the background of the city, the beautiful skyline um, overlooks. Um, it is um, part of the city of Houston's collection and they are charged with the care and maintenance of this piece. And very recently, um, it has been restored and re-waxed and it is absolutely magnificent right now. So the patina looks beautiful and I encourage you to come and take a look. And we will talk about a temporary project we did at this site around the Henry Moore later on. So this is a work that is also more recent by Jomé Plenza. Uh, that is part of what was originally a bridge called a Bridge of Tolerance. This is the Rosemont Bridge. Uh, this was established in 2011 and also, again, carries on this theme of text. That's right. These are Joma Plenza, a Spanish artist, um, very well known. Um, uh, these Buddha-like figures, seven of them, which reference the seven continents, you can see in the foreground, um, they are made up of aluminum, or I think it's stainless steel, cut um, letters and symbols that reference, obviously, the languages of all of these continents together. So it creates, um, it suggests a sense of community um, and um, the perfect sort of um, um, enactment of um, tolerance. Um, and um, at night, they're beautifully lit. I think we have a slide in the evening. Um, and they sit there like beacons um, uh, on Ellen Parkway. And this was uh, developed, funded through the Mossbacker Foundation and also uh, funded by the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, so this is just an example of how we partner with other entities to make these projects possible. Sesquicentennial Park, this harkens back a bit to, uh, this project was first established in 1986 and then uh, the second phase of it was in 1998. So that is why some of the projects that you will see in this park are dated to 1998. Uh, but this project, this park contains many, many projects, um, including this project by Mel, Mel Chin that we'll show you in a moment, as well as a sculpture of George H.W. Bush that many have seen there. Uh, a monument to Jim Baker, James Baker, and also a bridge uh, dedicated to Robert Mossbacker. So a more close-up image of the Mel Chin project. This was done in collaboration with young people who were born in the year 1986, the, the starting place of this park. Um, and these are made of aluminum, right, Judy? Yes. And are etched with drawings that were made by these young people. Um, and the themes of these are uh, sort of the pillars of um, Houston's history in a way. Um, agriculture, energy, manufacturing, medicine, philanthropy, technology, and transportation. So these, uh, about 150 of drawings on each, on each pillar reference those themes. And many, many people in Houston know Mel Chin for other reasons because Mel is a, a a renowned artist who is originally from Fifth Ward, one of the neighborhoods we'll be working in a whole lot more in the near future. Another project adjacent to there, I think this was the first public art project I encountered when I moved to Houston, uh, is over the Preston Street Bridge. This is called the Big Bubble, and um, there's this mysterious button here that can be pressed and it triggers a bubble in the bayou below. So um, this is, as Karen referenced, uh, a curious button um, that calls us over, but is total, it is not uh, labeled. There's no idea of what, if one presses it, might happen. Um, so a real surprise uh, of cause and effect, interactive. And I understand there have been times when canoers and kayakers have been very surprised below when someone above happened upon it. So always, um, it's, it's always a joy to uh, walk by. I also love about this project that the medium is water itself. Um, and we'll see that as a theme as well as we show some of these other ones. 
So here's some water. Uh, project by Matthew Geller, also in Buffalo Bayou Park, Open Channel Flow. Do you want to talk about this, Judy? Uh, Matthew Geller, a New York artist. Um, this um, piece is also um, was um, commissioned with the Houston Arts Alliance um, as our partner. Um, and uh, yes, it's another one of cause and effect. There's a pump there. And as you pump, obviously, you get a refreshing shower. Uh, it's well loved, um, particularly by the skaters who are in the skate park nearby who take advantage of um, the refreshment. Another water-based project. This has since been retired, but this is just an example of how we can find a whole range of surfaces and opportunities for public art to be uh, uh, engaged for public artists to be engaged in what we do. Uh, this is our former skimmer boat. It was uh, designed or decorated by the art guys um, entitled Mighty Tidy. You can see these little eyeballs in the front as well as the pink color. And another transportation based project by the artist Mark Dion who came to visit and was inspired to create the Buffalo Bayou Invasive Plant Eradication Unit. Uh, you can see it in action here. That's yeah. right, an educational um, sort of exercise. And um, uh, Mark Dion, um, internationally known sort of urban archeologist of sorts, um, decided to address the invasive plant um, situation on the bayou. And he's here with helpers um, directing people about how they can help him in this effort to um, to erase the, uh, uh, the invasive species. A little booklet was designed, a field guide that was handed out to the visitors. And he has beautiful illustrations here um, that were done by a local artist, Gabriel Martinez. So this is a, uh, I, yes. I, because of its mobile nature, as Karen, Karen will tell you, it was meant to sort of circulate into the neighborhoods and to other, other spots and sort of educate everyone about our natural waterway. This is also a great transition to talking about the temporary art, art projects because um, Mark Dion's project really is best done when it's being activated by live audiences and docents is what he called the people who were to activate it. Um, so it's still in existence, but it's really, it really gets activated when people are involved. Temporary projects. Of course, uh, the, the most important uh, space that we have for temporary projects is the Buffalo Bayou Cistern, uh, which hopefully many of you have visited before. Um, it opened to the public in 2016, but it dates back to the 1920s and was the location for the, the source of water for Houston and was rediscovered when Buffalo Bayou Park was being designed um, when the designers were looking for parking. And uh, of course, never turned it into a parking garage, but rather um, this amazing restored Buffalo Bayou Park cistern. It's almost two foot field, football fields wide. And here's some other images of it. And you can see the reflection. The um, columns look to be endless here, um, which is one of the uh, amazing aspects, as well as the audio um, of this space. The uh, echo is about. I don't know, 17 seconds or so. Um, and when you come to visit, you can do the echo test. It's lots of fun. Um, here you see the walkway before the uh, restoration when it was, um, when, a, when a railing and an asphalt a surface or concrete surface was added and um, to up to code. And um, otherwise, the by intention, this, 221 column space was left rather raw and in its original state. So we offer uh, cistern tours year round. Uh, right now the cistern is closed, but we expect it to reopen soon, hopefully. And uh, we offer tours of that space, history tours. And then we also use it as a site for a biennial major installation. And we have now done two of these. So we will talk about those. Judy, so, you want to talk about this one because Judy was instrumental sure. in making this first one. Uh, this inaugural um, installation in December of 2016, you can see um, 
These are installations that run at least six, maybe 12 months, um, major, major undertakings, as you can imagine, um, to activate a space of this, of, of this size. Um, by Magdalena Fernandez, this um, was, uh, uh, was done in partnership with the, with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and their magnificent um, Latin American department. Um, it was, it is actually, this piece is actually in the collection of the museum and there has been shown um, in a small square room. So you can imagine what happened when Magdalena was presented with this space and completely reimagined her piece, which is both sound and light and references an evening rainstorm. So it was true magic. So that project had sound. And of course, also, I love this image because it plays off of the reflection in the small amount of water that remains in the bottom of the cistern. And here's another one that does that. So this was the second installation. Second installation um, by uh, a seasoned artist and well known to our audiences, Carlos Cruz Diaz. He was 95, I believe, when we began this, um, not, not able to travel, but we did all of our um, site visits and all of the tweaking by Skype. So it was terrific to have him on there. His characteristic colorful lines is what we see here, which is characteristic of all of his work. Um, the linear forms are also reflected onto these cubes that floated in the water. And it was just a magical sort of dematerialization of the space. Um, and uh, we uh, further um, engaged the public by um, offering them um, lab coats. And if you walked in the space with a white surface on, of course, you became part of the installation yourself. So hugely popular. So now we have the opportunity to present something new. Uh, the next installation in the cistern, and this is the first time that we're sharing this with anyone, uh, is coming this spring in March of 2021 by the Albanian born and Germany based artist Henri Sala, and it is called The Great Attractor. This is a little bit about Henri Sala, and Judy's going to talk a little bit about Henri as well. Just a hugely highly respected multimedia artist. His medium is light, music, sound, and film. Um, so for our presentation, he has imagined a, a magical film that will be shown in the cistern um, accompanied by a sound, a sound portion and um, a, a light show. And he will also be engaging the water with a ripple machine. So um, really uh, completely um, uh, sort of immersive. Um, you see here a visual, which is very hard to really decipher, but it is um, a, a, a section of a turntable and um, it will reveal itself soon about the music and um, the, the meaning of the great attractor. This image is a rendering and it is a video still, so that is why it's hard to decipher. But the references to the acoustics in the space through the use of music are really central to this project. And the use of, of course, of the reflective space and the vastness of the space. This is a hugely ambitious project for this international artist and we are incredibly, incredibly excited about it. And this will be his first large commission in, in the States. So very important for him. A project that we're also very proud of that is in our recent history is a project we did with the Highline Network, which is a group of um, infrastructure reuse projects around the US. Plus there's one group, I believe in Canada and one in Mexico now uh, that are part of this network. And the network is uh, organized for more than just public art, but this was the first joint public art uh, program through the Highline Network and was really spearheaded again by our wonderful Judy, who had the idea that some of the network members might do a public art project together. Uh, and then the, the theme of monuments came up, which of course is still really relevant right now. That's right. Um, it was um, the, the theme of the exhibition was determined by the curatorial staff at the 
High Line, um, and each city was um, charged with selecting five artists, five local artists, who could address the question of new monuments for new cities. Um, and, you know, as uh, Karen says, incredibly relevant, continues to be so. Um, ours was a very ambitious installation, as you see here, where benches were constructed. These are benches, places to sit, to collect, uh, so could the community could sit and contemplate these and, um, you know, develop a discourse around the subject. Um, here you see a view with the lovely uh, Henry Moore spindle in the background. These were placed in the meadow and also visible. Um, here are some of the entries from the Houston uh, artists, Jamal Cyrus. I see Jake and, Jake and, uh, remind me. Jake Margolin and Nick oh. Vaughn's project is right Jake here. I don't know if you can see my yeah, cursor, but right, right there. And then um, you can see Philip Pyle's project all the way off to the left, just a little yeah. bit. And uh, Vincent Valdez, also a, uh, a Texas-based artist is in here. And there were uh, many, many others. There were 25 pieces in total and five from Houston. So these traveled to other cities as well. And the um, and, and, and important to note that we collaborated with TXRX and Makerspace on the, in the East End, who um, took our ideas and made them a reality with these beautiful, beautiful light boxes. Yeah, and TXRX has this amazing workforce training program. So they use this as a project for the workforce training program in the, in the East End. Another temporary project, but this one in the East sector, is by a now Houston-based artist, newly Houston-based uh, Egyptian-American artist named Ganzir, who is known as a street artist and has worked all over the world. Uh, this is a project that I uh, spearheaded through my former role at the Mitchell Center for the Arts as part of our Countercurrent Festival. And we asked Ganzir to look for a site along the bayou in the East sector. And he found this site that is um, adjacent to Tony Marone Park, this is the North York Street Bridge. And he developed a project that is made in wheat paste. Um, you can still see it now, um, and there may be some additions to this later on as well. Uh, that was primarily female protagonists, which you know, street art is not known for its female protagonists that often, but he was trying to sort of redirect that narrative and present these female characters um, among several other characters. Um, who are painting here, but this project also references, it's called Perpetual War, and references the industrial and military history of the bayou as a means for transporting military equipment. Another temporary project uh, that it re references current events that was very recent was this project called We Are the Asteroid by an artist, Justin Bryce Griglia, uh, that was done really inspired by a local scholar that many of us know, Timothy Morton, who's a professor at Rice University, who had written the text that is on these uh, road signs that were repurposed for this project. Um, so sort of a, a whimsical, but also very serious intervention. That's right, this was a decommissioned um, road sign. Uh, important to know that it was solar powered. Um, and uh, it was initially um, installed at Rice University at the Moody Center. Uh, we partnered with them and took, took the installation, took the road sign um, after it had had its run there. Um, again, uh, a very curious thing to happen on. Um, at first, any viewer would wonder if these were some kind of warnings about traffic or something else and it soon became clear that this was really a discussion about the environment and um, very appropriate for us given what our mission is. So many of these projects, the temporary and permanent, really invite us to do programming around them to talk about the works and also animate them with, for example, performance. And so we're going to talk a little bit about programming as an extension of the public art program. This harkens back to at least 2006, when this was the beginning of the development of Buffalo Bayou Park, when the Sabine to Bagby Promenade was opened to the public after the renovation and the event was organized from a cultural standpoint by a New York-based organization called Minetta Brook that had done a lot of programming on the Hudson River waterways. 
So one of the main features of this event, which was attended by thousands of people, was a floating cinema, which is becoming a more and more popular thing, especially now during COVID for social distancing purposes. But this floating cinema was, was curated by Aurora Picture Show, a local organization that programmed on the floating cinema and invited people to watch this more ambient um, set of films that were being screened on it as it floated up and down the bayou. This was another program that was organized in partnership with the Mitchell Center in 2007, so shortly after that. Also on the Sabine to Bagby Promenade under the Sabine Street Bridge, we animated the underside of this beautiful bridge with uh, both a video artist and a DJ, Johnny DeCam, who was a Houston-based artist at the time, uh, did these projections. And uh, this was really fun because so many people just accidentally came upon this project while it was happening and joined the party under the bridge and experienced this sort of immersive environment. Another project like that, also very interactive, was with the Roar Picture Show by the artist Luke Savisky in 2015 on the silos, one of my very, very favorite sites along the east sector of the bayou. And what you see here was actually being created here by these people laying on these surfaces and being projected in real time on the silos. Luke Savisky works like this a lot, so he was invited back also to do this project at Allen's Landing um, under a bridge that I'm looking at pretty much right now we're sitting uh, with live projections also of visitors who stood in front of cameras and they were sort of layered one on top of the other. And this was done by uh, my organization, the Mitchell Center, uh, in, as part of our festival countercurrent. Phil Klein is a New York-based composer who created a piece of music that um, was intended to be played around the holidays in a processional format by each of the participants in the procession. So it was really designed originally for um, boom boxes and visitors are invited to, participants are invited to bring a boom box or in this case now it's a mobile device and maybe speakers and play the music concurrently as they traverse a space. Uh, I learned about this project when the local contemporary music organization Musica did a processional during, I think, Lights in the Heights, and I participated and then brought this idea to Buffalo Bayou Partnership to do along the bayou, and we did it for several years together, and then Buffalo Bayou Partnership did it on its own as well in a different site on the bayou, so it's just a really beautiful way to collectively celebrate the holiday season. Yes, hugely popular, and as you can see from all the projects that Karen is describing, um, everything very interactive, which is really our mode and our mission to interact with the spaces here on the bayou that we have and to develop programs that highlight the, the natural uh, waterway. Yes, and you can see that more here with Processional Arts Workshop, uh, something similar. Uh, People were invited, local residents were invited to create these beautiful paper lanterns. So you can see that here and then participate in a processional uh, as a celebration of the opening of Buffalo Bayou Park. Um, another totally participatory project is the Bayou Art, the Bayou Art Bio Art Biotorium, which is a project by the local artist, East End based artist named Henry Sanchez that is still ongoing. Um, Henry repurposed a shipping container for this project and invited families to come in and explore the plants and animals and the, the natural resources of the bayou uh, in using all the technology that he placed inside the shipping container. So you can see a little bit of that here. And then participants were invited to make art. So this very, is very much the same type of theme that Mark Dion explored in his um, invasive species eradication unit. You can see a little more of that there. And there will be more of this to come because as I said, this project is ongoing and received a grant from the Houston Arts Alliance. And one of the other ways that we have engaged with the East Sector so far is through a partnership with the University of Houston graphic design program where students used text and designed surfaces and placed them throughout the east sector of Buffalo Bayou in some of the really interesting sites 
along the bayou so you can see how these sites can be activated even now. You heard, if you listened to the presentation last week, you heard a bit about Jaffet Creek and the silo site that we showed before. And that's a great segue into talking a little bit more about Buffalo Bayou East. Um, so the mission of Buffalo Bayou East is written here, but just for the sake of emphasizing it, uh, this Buffalo Bayou Partnership is revitalizing the Buffalo Bayou by creating parks and trails and acquisition of green space, as well as promoting the economic and social well-being of surrounding waterfront neighborhoods through development of mixed income intergenerational housing opportunities and restoration of historic sites. A, a, a submission of our overall mission that we really hope to pursue through arts and culture, among many other um, endeavors in the East Sector. So just to provide a picture of Buffalo Bayou East and the many sites in the East Sector, some are very industrial, some are very wild, but there's a whole lot to see and experience um, as we head East. This is our Turkey Bend site, which was also talked about last week and will be an amazing site for public art in the future and programming and um, really designed for and with the neighborhood. Right, and uh, artists can't wait to get their hands on that space already. There's been lots of interest. And then a, a former sewage treatment facility that is also a property of ours that can be activated with public art. Um, so these are just some examples of some of the really interesting sites along Buffalo Bayou East. Um, Buffalo Bayou Partnership has done a ton of already talking with neighborhoods and listening to neighborhood resident, uh, residents about what they want to see in these neighborhoods. These are their sites and we will be developing projects with people, not for people or to people, but with people utilizing all of the creative energy in the neighborhoods where we'll be working over the next many, many years. And the institutions as well that are yes. active there for sure. Um, yes, and also these are really places that we hope will provide a, um, a platform for communication and dialogue as we develop our projects and also connecting communities that are now um, somewhat divided just by the, by the waterway. So this was the, um, and this is our last slide, and then we'd like to hear your questions, that this is the, um, the launch party for the Buffalo Bayou East Master Plan, which just took place practically yesterday in October 20 of, of 2019. Um, and then you heard more about that master plan last week from our project manager, hopefully Jose Solis. And if you did not hear it, it is on our website. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Jessica, who's gonna conduct our Q&A. Hi, can you see me? Okay, great, yeah, thank you all for uh, joining. And I, we already had a few great questions, but if you have any questions, please ask them in the, in the chat right now and we'll um, do as many as we can. So um, someone asked, do we have a gallery of teachers on our website? We do, it's on buffalobayou.org slash public dash box and I'm also having an email pull up. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Yes, yeah, your audio is breaking up, so we can't we can't hear the question. Um, I don't oh, know if it's sorry. Me, but I couldn't hear the can question. You so I might have to write it out. Try again. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, someone asked me um, if there are places you can see the gallery of these pieces, and there is. It's on our website, buffalobayou.org slash public dash arts. Um, first question, who funds the artist commissions? So we work with many, many partners, and some of those were uh, referenced earlier, uh, but we work with many, many partners on funding these projects. Some of the projects we have to do very active and rigorous fundraising for it, but some yeah. of them are done in partnership with, as we said, the Houston Arts Alliance and private funders who may approach us or other agencies that approach us to use the Buffalo Bayou Partnerships site and really partner with us on developing these projects. So Judy, do you wanna say more about that? Well, just, I'm oh, sorry. You were good before. We got, now we yeah. lost your eye. Yeah, all right, okay. Um, just that uh, really um, recently we have relied heavily on um, foundations and also uh, private philanthropy to uh, realize some of our big projects. As you all know, the, philan the artistic philanthropy 
philanthropic community here, philanthropic community here in Houston is incredibly generous. And for the Cruz Diaz project, for example, we had an amazing grant from the Brad and Leslie, um, Brad and Leslie Fuker Foundation. Um, we have had grants from the Brown Foundation um, and you know, lots of other individuals who um, help make these, th these things possible. But you're right, whoever asked the question, they're hugely expensive and the, most of the projects are not on our regular, you know, general operating uh, budget that we have. So they're all an extra, extra um, fundraising for us. I also just wanna add that the Brown Foundation made it possible for the cistern to be visited again. So even just the sort of groundwork, literally yeah. to make a site uh, visitor friendly, is, uh, is a fundraising, pro a huge fundraising project in and of itself, and the Brown Foundation made that possible. So where um, should artists send proposals, or where are their calls for proposals listed? So right now, we do not offer calls for proposals. This is a curated program. However, uh, I firmly believe that if we do not hear from artists what you're project ideas are, we really won't be taking advantage of our arts community. So send them, send them our way. We don't have a formal proposal process. It might take a little while for us to get back to you, but um, it doesn't mean that we're not looking at your ideas and welcoming them. As we head east though, there will be probably some more formal ways for artists to get involved in generating ideas very much in partnership with us. So those can be realized in those neighborhoods, particularly artists from the neighborhoods where we'll be working. And we can provide your uh, Karen's email maybe to the audience at some point in the chat, because if it's Karen that's receiving the information, that's of course the most direct uh, way to engage. Um, and likewise, I will emphasize that your your um, ideas are very, very important to us. And um, that's how we find our most um, interesting kind of programming um, sort of activations. So uh, please, please come, bring them on. We'd love to see them. If you sent your idea by Instagram though, or <laughs> no. Facebook, I mean, we're gonna get your ideas eventually. Our staff is small enough that we are listening and we will receive your ideas and respond. It just might take a little while if every you know, artist in our community is sending us ideas, but we want to hear them. Um, the Cistern is a bit of a more formally planned program where we do, we are committed to only hosting a project every two years right now. That's not to say that things may not change eventually, but that is the structure of the program right now. This is a, this is a good question. How do you determine the right length of time to keep a temporary installation live for the public to enjoy? You wanna try that, Judy? <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? It's sort of a moving target. I have to say, we generally start out with a, uh, maybe a six month or a three month run, depending on what the project is. Um, what's happened to almost all of our temporary projects in the last five years or so is that they've become so popular that we have been able to extend them. So as I said, it's a little bit of a moving target. Generally, we don't do any um, temporary art program for less than three months. It depends. If we were doing something, let's just say, with materials that literally disintegrate, that would dictate how long the project could stay up. And there may be something like that with natural materials. But yes, we, we say three to six months typically, it seems, with our projects. Longer for the cistern because it's an amazingly huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, is there an effort to showcase Houston artists and to balance diversity of artists, women and people of color? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Very much so. uh, all, all affirmative. Um, and if you go and look at the uh, participants in the Monuments exhibition, for example, you will see the breadth of the talent we have here um, in you know, all of those areas. So yes, it's very important to us. Are there any other plans to highlight the history of Houston in these installations? She said, love the cistern. That's a great question. The, and the Cistern, we do have these history tours, but an artist who, whose work is inspired by that history, I mean, even Henri Sala's project is inspired by Houston's history very much, and you'll hear more about that as the 
the project is unveiled. Um, but I will say that the history of the East sector is really central to so much of what we will do. And we probably will have a whole lot that, that references that history that happens in terms of arts and culture in, in those neighborhoods. Uh, is there a scavenger hunt for guests to view the beautiful art? And uh, I can really answer this and just say on our Buffalo Bayou guide online, it lists all of the spots of the art. So I guess you could go, you know, by piece by piece. We also have a really great audio tour that we partnered with Houston Public Media on that is also housed on our website. So you can pop in your earbuds and just take like a quick walk along the bayou to find all the art. If someone's anxious to uh, develop a scavenger hunt, we'd love to, we'd love to see it. Yeah, they could be self-made. You could make your own scavenger hunt and share it with us. We yeah. would love to have that. Uh, given the vibrant street mural artist presence here in town, are there any plans to coordinate with that community to showcase their works? Many cities have these sorts of installations and are great tourist destinations. Yes, um, the East End is particularly known for its mural program. And that's a program that is very much, um, there's a ton of ownership in that neighborhood of that mural program. And I have heard that it's going to keep growing. Uh, we don't have a mural tour along the Buffalo Bayou, but we certainly will be taking advantage of some of the surfaces that are, invite wall work um, of all kinds as we, uh, as we keep developing these sites. So that's about all I can say about the murals now is I do believe there is a really wonderful mural tour and also Washington Avenue Arts District is doing a lot with murals. Um, so I agree, there's really great murals in Houston. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there'll is, be opportunities to engage our um, you know, incredible wealthy community of mur muralists, yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, this is a great question probably for Judy being co-chair of the Public Art Committee, but they asked, are artists slash artwork chosen by the committee? Um, the committee does have a role in choosing artworks and um, the whole proposal process, yes. And the committee is composed both of, um, of board members, but also outside curatorial expertise, as Karen was uh, at one time on our board, so that we get a very good um, broad, broad view of um, what, you know, of decision making. And, um, it's, we also engage a pro project manager, the wonderful Wine Garden Art Group, who also um, helps bring projects to the table. And they are the people who help us with the, um, the management of these large projects. I failed to mention at the beginning that we are not joined today by our other uh, Public Art Committee co-chair, Haroldina Wise, but she is really instrumental also in driving some of the programmatic ideas that we receive and are uh, put through the committee. Um, in that same vein, how are you going to choose public art in the East End? And are there opportunities to incorporate um, some sort of graffiti park like they have in Austin? Um, or is that stuff going to be incorporated together? How is that going to work? Well, the short answer is I don't know yet everything. I know we will have input. I know that each of these amazing sites will be an opportunity for public art and that we are definitely interested in working with local artists and engaging local artists. One of our sites, the Turkey Bend site, has this uh, warehouse attached to it that is filled with graffiti that was completely uh, done by artists just entering the site and creating that graffiti in the site. Um, I happen to really love what's there now. So to the extent that we can embrace things that are already there and just enhance them, I think that's a big, uh, a, a big part of what we'd like to do. Um, but the, the, the short answer to the question is that we're still developing the process, but we are even taking community input in terms of what that process should look like. Okay. Um, we are, oh, here's another question. When things get back to normal, are you planning any art walking tours? That's a great question. Well, and that's really in your, um, <laughs> your expertise, uh, Jessica, if you want to um, tell, talk a little bit about the history and what you have planned going forward. And even the fifth anniversary. <laughs> yeah. I'm not this old planner, but um, I am a little bit involved, but we did have art, art walking tours every quarter up until the pandemic happened and we had a few scheduled that we had to unfortunately cancel but yes we 
as soon as we can and we're eager to, we are wanting to get back into the walking tours along with our nature walks and our East End walking tours. So that's definitely in the future when it's safe enough. So yes. And we did do a bike tour too at one point, I believe. Yes, we had a really cool tour called Art on Wheels where we partnered with B-Cycle. They let us rent their bikes for free and we rode around with a docent and stopped at different destinations along Buffalo Bayou. Um, so that's another great way to get involved with the art along Buffalo Bayou. Um, but do you guys wanna say your favorite art pieces or installations or programs that Buffalo Bayou Partnership has done before we wrap up? I think our audience should. I can't play favorites. <laughs> yeah. Well, someone said they went to the 2006 Sabine Promenade grand opening, which I think is really cool and a testament to say that. I mean, that was almost 15 years ago and people are still really heavily involved in our projects. Yeah. Yes, um, I was there too and it was an amazing event. Um, I will say that I'm, again, not going to play favorites, but I loved New Monuments for New Cities. And I was able to participate in some of the public programming, even though I didn't work here yet for New Monuments for New Cities. Uh, but I loved what the local Houston artists came up with for the project. We got so much amazing feedback from people um, who were just curious what the, what the project was, stopped on their bike or when they were walking, or parked their car and went and looked at it and engaged with a whole bunch of really relevant issues and learned about artists they didn't know before. That's right. That was great. Um, of course, I'm very um, partial to the cistern installations. Of course. Of course. And we look forward to what's to come. Um, so we're going to wrap up. And if you have any more questions, feel free to email me or Karen um, and we will get back to you. We will have this recording available tomorrow and we'll send it to all of you guys who registered. And then we'll have all three of the recordings up on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, tomorrow as well. So thank you so much again and um, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks.